You are listening to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to I Am Refocused Radio. Once again, we are here today. And today, man, we have a true honor. We have a special guest with us today. We have Kenneth Conkin, and he is a lawyer and father of triplets with a very inspiring life story. We have him on the show, and I can't wait to learn more about his amazing story. If you want, you can hit that subscribe button, but don't forget, go on refocusradio.com to catch other amazing, powerful stories. You can also go to our guest website today. It's kenconkin.com. First and foremost, Kenneth, thank you for your time. How are you doing today? Thank you. I'm doing great, and thank you for having me as a guest. Well, let's start out with your life uh, story. Tell us a little bit about what got you interested into uh, your professional career, and then obviously we'll get into your health and also your inspirational story. Okay. Well, I worked for a little over 40 years as an assistant district attorney in Nassau County, Long Island. And there were, I would say, two different uh, things that got me interested in my career. One is I have an older brother named Steve, who's two years older than me, and he worked as a defense attorney for many years as a criminal defense attorney. Now, obviously, I ended up on the other side. I worked as a prosecutor, but I used to watch my brother in court, thought it looked not only very interesting, but something I could do physically. So let me just tell you a little bit about my physical condition. In 1970, at the beginning of my junior year in college at Cornell University, I broke my neck and damaged my spinal cord, making a tackle on a kickoff in a lightweight football game against Columbia University. And as a result, I'm a quadriplegic. I'm almost totally paralyzed from the shoulders down. So, at least physically, uh, while I have limitations, I can still talk. And working as a trial attorney seemed like the best place for me to work where my physical limitations would not impose uh, a sufficient hardship that I wouldn't be able to function as a trial attorney. But in addition, I worked for a couple of years as a vocational rehabilitation counselor for other individuals with severe disabilities. And often at my work, I would be speaking at conferences and before groups and organizations concerning non-discrimination and affirmative action for people with disabilities. And after my talks, I would often be asked questions. And while I would do my best to answer those questions, I was always careful to Tell the listener that tell the questioners they should really consult with a lawyer about their concerns. So with that in mind, I also thought there's no reason why I couldn't become that lawyer. So I decided to leave my job as a rehabilitation counselor and I went to law school. So I did it with those two goals in mind, one to be a trial attorney, but two also to help people with disabilities. When you look at the fact that in uh, 1970, you you were a football player. You was on track to do what you wanted to do in life. When that injury happened to you, we know right now that you didn't let that stop you from doing great things, not just for yourself in life, but what you're doing for others. Kind of touch on that road of reality understanding that okay this might be my life right now but it's not the end of my life as far as professionally and what i can contribute to society absolutely and you know i was very fortunate that i had a lot of help and support from my family following my injury as well as some from good friends who encouraged me to do as much with my life as possible. And they basically assured me they would act as my arms and legs to make sure I could still do everything that I wanted to do. I mean, you look at the opportunities that came with after uh, law school and position you to be a voice for 
for those who might need a little bit more assistance to be heard, what was some of the challenges along the way? Because I'm sure it wasn't yeah. like you snap your fingers and yeah. boom. There, there were certainly you. many challenges, but let me tell you the first challenge as a lawyer. Um, I went to Hofstra University Law School. I completed law school in the standard three-year time period. I passed a very difficult New York State bar exam, first time that I took it. And I began my work as an assistant district attorney by going through a very intensive four-week training program where they taught us all aspects of trial techniques from a prosecutor's perspective. And I was so proud and excited to go to court my first day, only to find I couldn't fit through the swinging doorways in the courtroom. They were too narrow for me to get through in my electric wheelchair. So when you talk about challenges I faced in my legal career, that was one of the first, just being able to fit into the courtroom and to be able to get to the prosecutor's table. People on the outside can assume things, especially when they don't understand the story, the story behind of what happened on 1970. And the story that continues to be written till today for those on the outside who sometimes prematurely think about something before un understanding the story behind it. Why is it such important for people to embrace everybody despite what they might assume? Well, we all have the same needs, wants and desires, whether you have a disability or not. And I think we all can add a lot to the community, regardless of what our physical, mental, or intellectual capabilities are. And I think a more inclusive society wants to include everybody. I think when you hear the words diversity, equity, and inclusion, some people for some reason have a, a negative impression about what that entails. It's actually an excellent uh, endeavor to include more people, in fact, to include as many people as you can uh, into the workplace, right? Into society in general to participate. And if I might give you one example from my work in the district attorney's office, when you leave the job in the district attorney's office, you go through what's called an exit interview where you meet with somebody in the personnel department and you discuss what you like best about the job and what you think could be improved about the job. And I was told on a number of occasions that what the assistant district attorney indicated they liked best about the job was meeting, working with, and getting to know me. Now, I know they weren't saying meeting and getting to know Ken Kunkin. I'm sure what they were referring to was meeting, getting to know, and working with someone with a significant disability because unless they had a close relative with a disability, most people don't come into daily contact with somebody with a disability, particularly in the workforce. And I think a number of the things that impressed them was that for the most part, I had a positive attitude and a pleasant disposition and that working with me did not mean any additional work for them. They found that I was a hard worker, that I carried my weight in the workplace and was often very helpful to them as well. I rose to become a supervisor in the district attorney's office where I was helping supervise more than 25 other assistant district attorneys. And I think it was a revelation to many people what it is like to work in close contact with somebody with a disability. And I was so pleased to hear that not only did it impress a lot of people, but a lot of people said that was the best part of their job. Once again, this is Aubrey Focus Radio talking to our guest today, Ken Cunton. Go to his website. It's Ken Conkins, uh, excuse me, KenConkin.com. That, that's again, KenConkin.com. When you look at how you could have, you could have quit a long time ago, but for some reason you made up in your mind that he's going to, make something great out of something that was uh, a bad situation. When you see the uh, the ways your your life uh, 
the journey where it led you to where you are to, uh, today. What are some of the things that you cherish most about learning from that situation and possibly how it could have been a blessing for how you were able to give back to the community? Well, what I learned, what I had hoped I knew before my injury, but I certainly learned, learned afterwards, was the importance of family and good friends play in your life. And I think that's so important to everybody. Now, I was so blessed that I had a support system that didn't let me quit, that kept me motivated, that kept me wanting to do more with my life. And knowing that I had the support and help and encouragement from friends and family to enable me to do so. Also, after completing uh, my schooling, I was able to go to work and work as uh, a vocational rehabilitation counselor for a couple of years. And after receiving so much help from so many other people, that gave me the opportunity to pay back and to help others. And that really changed how I felt about myself and life in general, that I knew I still had a lot to offer people. And then I was in a position to help others. And it also gave me the increased self-esteem and self-confidence to say there's still more that I could do. And that's why I decided to then go to law school and work as an assistant district attorney. And I've been so fortunate to be able to have the opportunity to do that. And I think when people with disabilities are looking for a job, all they're basically asking for potential employees is just give us the opportunity to show what we can do. And once you give us that opportunity, I think everybody will be pleasantly surprised and impressed to know that we can be some of the hardest workers, most loyal and competent employees an employer can ever hope to find. You also are a father. When you talk to your sons, you spoke on uh, confidence. Well, some of the things that you try to instill in their minds so that they can always be confident in whatever they do in life. Okay, that's a great question. And as you alluded to in your introduction, uh, I'm the father of triplet boys. I have three incredible sons. They're all 19 years old. They're currently sophomores at three different colleges in upstate New York and doing absolutely great. And what I've tried to instill in them is to have the proper character to know that they're blessed with the opportunity to help others in all that they do. That it's not just about themselves, but that they need to give back to the community and give to each other. I, I am so pleased that my boys are very close with their brothers. And that's something that I wanted to emphasize, the importance of family, the importance of teamwork, the importance of helping others. And I'm so pleased that they've grown up and taken that to heart and do their best to help each other when they can, but to help others as well. And to have the self-confidence to know that they can tackle almost any challenge and still do well, as long as they worked hard, try their best, continue to improve and not be afraid to take chances or to face difficult situations and to tackle them head on. Once again, listen, I refocus radio We're talking to our guest today, Ken Kunt. Ken, you can go to his website, KenKunkin.com. When you look at uh, what you're doing right now, being on this show, this is not the first one you've been on. You've been on many uh, different platforms. Did you ever have on your bingo card that you'd be on all these different platforms, media platforms to share your story? You know, that's another great question. Before my in I was very shy. I'd be the person that would sit in the very back of the classroom, never raise his hand, and never try to draw attention to himself. And now I'm in a position where I speak before hundreds of people at a time, delivering motivational and hopefully inspirational talks about what I've been doing with my life and encouraging people to do more with their lives. And I believe it's given me a platform to be able to get up in front of people and show them, not just tell them, but show them what can be done through hard work, determination, 
perseverance, and most importantly, the right attitude. That is such an important part of everything that you do. And speaking of uh, right attitude, when you look at uh, self-accountability for yourself and what you had to endure, the price you had to continually, uh, continuously pay to maintain a, a high value of yourself, what well, some of the uh, core foundational uh, North Star core uh, guidance that you use in your life that was like a North Star for you to keep treading forward? That everybody has a lot to offer, that everybody's life is worthwhile, and that everybody through different parts of their life can use help assistance, a helping hand. And when you're in the position to give that, take advantage of it and help others. In fact, there's nothing that makes me feel better than knowing that I've helped other people achieve what they want to achieve in life and help them reach their career goals. But I have to say when, you know, you talk about what I've done with my education, what I've done in my employment, what brings me the most satisfaction and pleasure is the of being a good husband and a good father. And being the father of triplet boys, I cannot begin to tell you what an incredible thrill and sense of enjoyment that's been for me. But if I might give two more pieces of advice, one would be the importance of participating. It would have been so easy for me to just sit home and not do anything with my life. And unfortunately, many people do that. And it's so important to push yourself, to get out there, to be active and to participate in different activities that life has to offer. Secondly, I'd like to emphasize the importance of keeping expectations high. When I was in the hospital, it seemed like the best the medical personnel thought that I would ever be able to do would be to someday sell magazine subscriptions over the telephone. Now, I was determined to do more than that. And I think, unfortunately, that people's perceptions often limit what some people will eventually accomplish. I saw many of the fellow patients that I was in the rehab center with not doing a lot with their lives because they weren't encouraged to do so. In fact, it seemed like the medical personnel thought that the best they could ever do would be basically to sit home and watch television and not be active in the community. And I think it's so important to keep your expectations high because people's performance often rises and falls based upon what others expect of them. And that applies to yourself as well. You've got to keep your expectations for yourself high as well. And if I have a message to convey to others, that would be part of that message. Another part would be to keep hope up. Never lose hope. There's always a lot that you can do with your life and never lose hope, even when it seems darkest. And speaking of hope, sometimes uh, the tragedy is not when someone says you can't do it, it's when you believe them. Because when you don't get up for yourself and choose to keep moving forward in life, that's when not only did they win, but you lost. It's a guaranteed loss when you quit. And I'm glad you said what you said because uh, I think a lot of people can relate if they reflect on uh, a time in their life where they almost quit. If I, if I would have stopped five years ago, I would not be where I am today. And that could be a story for a lot of people out there. For someone who might be in the midst of a dark storm, because life happens. And it doesn't give, it doesn't ask you for permission to happen. It just comes at you whether you're ready or not. That's right. What do you say to that person uh, to encourage them that there is hope uh, after that storm is, is passing by? You know, sometimes you can't control everything that happens to you, but you can control how you react to it. And it's your reaction to what happens to you that is important. You know, don't listen to naysayers. Don't listen to the people that you can't do something or that it's just too difficult. 
What is important is how you feel about yourself and what you believe you can do and accomplish. And while I don't suggest making unrealistic expectations, I do suggest there's a lot that you can do. And just because something has not been done before doesn't mean that you can't do it now. So keep your hope up, keep your expectations up, and never settle for less than the best that you can do. Once again, listen to Refocus Radio talking to our guest today, Ken Conkin. Go to his website, KenConkin.com. As we are almost uh, wrapping this up, when you, when you think about the life that you've been able to live, when you check the mile markers of proof that, wow, because I didn't quit at this time, this door opened up for me later on in life. I was able to walk through that door and I got some more experience and then it led me to maybe some uh, bumps in the road, but eventually there was another door that left me uh, with another opportunity. What's one thing that you see has been a common thread for you to be able to overcome those bumps in the road to understand that I can do what I think I can do as long as I take the action to do it. You know, part of it, as I indicated before, is the help, encouragement, and support that I've received from family and friends. There was nothing that I did or accomplished that I could have done on my own without a lot of help. And I was fortunate that I had that help. But it, then it always gets to the point where you've got to take the reins pick yourself up and make something of your life. And it's so important that you do that, that you're determined to do the best you can do at anything and don't let, you know, the negatives in life keep you down. It's so important to participate. And I was very fortunate that when the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed, in 1990, more facilities were made accessible to people with disabilities. I mean, before that, it was very difficult for somebody in a wheelchair to get out and take advantage of activities in public because there were steps in almost every building, it seemed, and there were no curb cuts around, and there was no accessible transportation. And the Americans with Disabilities Act has made an enormous difference in so many people's lives, whether you use a wheelchair or not. So I was very fortunate when that act was passed and a lot of its legislation was put into action. And there is so much that can be done to help everybody that, you know, keep moving forward, don't lose hope and keep your expectations high. My last question is for the younger generation. Uh, you be able to live a life that you can reflect on. And sometimes it doesn't happen for everybody. So for the young people and understanding how important what we do with our time is, what would you suggest that they keep in mind and back of their head as they navigate their own journey in life as far as how they utilize their time? You know, I, I believe we all have a certain innate ability that helps us to function and handle difficult situations. But I also believe that we all have an inner strength, an inner strength that enables us to rise to the occasion and tackle almost insurmountable odds. And it's how you use that inner strength that will make the difference between someone who is good and someone who is great. So you've got to use that inner strength that everyone has. Don't sweat the small stuff, you know, look at the bigger picture and do your best to not only uh, do everything you want to do, but to help others so that they can also do everything they want to do with the proper assistance. And there's so much everybody can do together to help each other, to help everybody succeed. Again, that's not we focus radio We're talking to our guest today, Ken Conkin. Go to his website, KenConkin.com. Like always, we want to say to you, thank you for your time. Thank you. I appreciate that. And if I might just add that I actually wrote a book about my life. It's called I Dream of Things That Never Were, the Ken Conkin story. And if you go to my website, that will indicate different ways that it could be purchased. Although most people I know go directly to Amazon and purchase it there. 
So thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about my life and what I've done 